Stephen, congratulations. What, it's like 600 pages. I could do <laughs> arm curls with this book. It was a massive undertaking on your part. Yeah, well, um, I really wanted to dig in and get the definitive story. It was important to me because Facebook got so important that I had to take a little more time and kill more, a few more trees than I normally would in order to tell the story right. So uh, do you think that the folks at Facebook would be happy with the net effect of the book? I promised them that, uh, and it really wasn't a, a, a something we did explicitly, but you know, underlying it, there, I, there was a promise that I'd be fair. Right. That was understood between us. Right. And that's really the only promise that you know, and that I, I made with them. They had no ability to read the book beforehand or anything like that. And I feel that I lived up to that. And I think that they see it now, and they say, uh, I think they made a statement saying, "Hey, this was painful for us. Um, we don't agree with everything in the book, but they think it's fair." What most interests me, because I'm a political junkie, actually two things interest me. I'm fascinated with what went on in Kirkland House, mm. you know, some of which was captured in maybe... place at Harvard, yeah. Yes, some of which was captured in social network, maybe not entirely accurately. I'm going to talk to you here at the library about that in some detail. But the politics, the way in which Facebook was used in 2016 by the Trump campaign, completely legitimate, by the way. I'm not, I'm not referencing fake news. I'm not referencing DC leaks or Cambridge Analytica. I mean Brad Parscale and the Trump campaign. They knew what they were doing, and Hillary's campaign didn't utilize Facebook. Yeah, it's almost like Hillary felt that she was above that, whereas the Trump campaign uh, spent you know, a huge amount of money on there, like a really significant percentage of their of their budget on Facebook, using it in the most exotic ways. Sometimes serving 175,000 ads on one day. Wow! And the people at Facebook, they watched this with a degree of awe. And that even though they provided help, they felt that no one was getting more out of Facebook than the Trump campaign. A lot of them, of course, were Hillary supporters, but they weren't really alarmed because they thought there's no way Trump's going to win, even right. with the ads. So, and, and when you say they provided assistance, we should make clear, they treated the Trump campaign like any other advertiser. There was not favoritism, right. uh, far from it. but. When you spend, I knew this, I know this, pardon me, from reading your book, when you spend the kind of money that the Trump campaign was spending on Facebook, you get resources. They'll send somebody over and right. set up shop in your office if you want. Well, that's right. They sent people over, and the offer was to Hillary. Interestingly, they send Republicans over to Republican campaigns, and they would have sent Democrats over to Hillary uh, because they wanted those people to be trusted. There's another theme in the book about this constant concern at Facebook, at the way in which they are portrayed in the conservative community. That 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 they were they're always worried of being perceived at this very liberal outlet based in Palo Alto, which I guess would be bad for business. And maybe they erred to excess right. in making sure that that wasn't the case. Yeah, they really bent over backwards, and you know this was uh, augmented by a switch in their Washington office. It used to be uh, run by a, uh, a woman who was comes from the Democratic side, and she hired a guy who used to work for the Bush administration, um, and they sort of balanced each other out. But when the woman left and went to Instagram, the, the guy named Joel Kaplan hired um, a guy who used to be the FCC commissioner, Kevin Martin, and all of a sudden Republicans are running the Facebook office. So when fake news comes up, and, and it really became an issue during the last few weeks of the election, right. Obama, if you remember, was actually going on the campaign trail talking against it uh, you know, in, in support of Hillary. Um, Facebook made a decision saying, we're going to stay hands off it. And some people in the Facebook office felt that that decision was made specifically to help the Republicans because the, the bulk of the fake news was pro-Trump, anti-Hillary. Well, I, I want to just, I want to look at my note for, to be reminded of something. Um, there was an example that you give in the book of fake news. The Denver Guardian right. doesn't even exist. Yeah, right? it sounds real, doesn't it, though? Yeah, it, sa it sounds impressive. Oh, the Denver Guardian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, headline, FBI agent suspected in Hillary email leaks found dead in apparent murder-suicide. 
500,000 shares, headline viewed 15 million times, total bullshit. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, th it turned out that one little town in Macedonia was a hotbed for this stuff. They find something written by an extreme right-wing blogger and post it up, and people would come to the page. They'd make a bundle. And meanwhile, uh, articles by the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, only would get a fraction of those hits. Something else from your book, page 359. Last three months of the election, in the last three months of the election, the engagement from fake news stories on Facebook exceeded those from mainstream outlets. In the final three months, more bogus news right. than real news. And, you know, I, I document a meeting that took place around that time where Facebook decided, we're not going to mess with this. And, you know, and it turned out that their non-involvement was a form of involvement. Well, okay, and when I read that part of the book, I said to myself, this reminds me of the Obama administration knowing that the Russians were screwing with the election, but being fearful of blowing the whistle for fear that people would think they're putting their thumb on the side of the scale. Was it the same kind of concern that caused Facebook to take a hands-off approach? In, in, in some ways, but in other ways, you know, like a lot of people in, in the Washington office on the other side of the aisle felt that you know, uh, it really was something that, that meant to help the Republicans. There was one other instance I write about where uh, it took place a little earlier when uh, the, you know, this guy mixed uh, a voting registration campaign. And you'd think that that'd be something that Facebook would like to help the people register to vote. Sure. But because, these people told me, uh, he favored the Republicans, he felt that a lot of people registering to vote would be bad for Republicans. Final question for you, and thanks for being so gracious with your time. What worries you the most about 2020, the, the sanctity of the election in 2020, relative to Facebook? I worry that uh, the playbook of 2016 is going to change to a new playbook, which is designed to get around the fixes that Facebook made after that election. In other words, as smart as Facebook might be, Facebook might be in trying to protect itself, there are always smart people out there trying to do bad things. It's a moving target, and I think they'll uh, find, you know, uh, ways to use Facebook and, you know, and, and you know, manipulate again because essentially Facebook still is the same. It's a platform where fake news can spread and circulate. You you had. Uh, when I say final question, this time I mean it. Oh, come on. <laughs> so uh, you had extraordinary it's like the access. Who tour, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hell freezes over. So you had extraordinary access to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. But with regard to Zuckerberg, what would surprise the rest of us about what it's like to be with him and to spend time with him? I think uh, he is a, a, a really thoughtful person. Um, he asks questions of you. He's a, people describe him as a learning machine. So he's always trying to suck up information. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you get see the gears whirring within his head sometimes because he very much is of, of what he describes as the engineering mindset. So there's this mix of engagement in terms of, hey, what can you tell me? but also a little bit... Um, He's a sponge. Yeah. He's yeah. always looking to just absorb information. Right. And, and But the way he applies it is, is more algorithmically than emotionally, say. What I was thinking as I was reading it, so many businesses that he gobbled up along the way, and other businesses in Silicon Valley that someone founds and then they make money and they cash out, but he's still there and running it. Right. Is that going to be the case in five years? Um, I think it probably will be. Do you? Yeah. Two words I've never heard in all the interviewing I've done at Facebook is succession plan. Really? Interesting. That's a good note on which to leave it. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations again on the book. Well, thanks, Michael.